Thank you, Brother Ithamar, and good morning, brethren and sisters. I thought this morning we would take a look at our second reading in Zechariah 2 and 3 uh, and draw a couple lessons from, from this because I thought both Zechariah and, and the Jude reading were, were extremely appropriate uh, for, the, for the times that we're living in. Um, and so you know, looking at the two of them, I was trying to choose uh, they, they really go hand in hand in quite a bit, but I wanted to focus on Zechariah this, uh, this morning and draw a couple lessons from this, uh, this portion, uh, the, this portion of the reading. And specifically, uh, you know, I wanted to, to help focus our minds this morning, to, to focus our minds on the emblems, but more significantly to focus our minds on what lies ahead, what we're looking forward to, the time that's at our doorstep when Christ will return and establish his kingdom. And what we see here in Zechariah 2 and 3, you know, exactly as uh, Brother Uthmar pointed out, is these are visions of the kingdom. These are visions of the kingdom uh, that is soon to be here. And uh, and thank you, Sister Abby, for, for choosing the hymns. I didn't choose the hymns. Uh, I, I told Sister Abby the, the, the theme and the topic, and she chose the hymns. And that last hymn is precisely appropriate for, for what we're going to be talking about this morning. Um, we are truly living in spectacular times. We're living in, uh, in a time, in a moment in history of the earth, like there has been uh, no other. There's been no other time like the one that we're living in. And I say that not because we and many other countries are on lockdown, though we are. I'm not saying that because we're facing a global pandemic, though we are. Neither of those things are unique or new. In reality, in history, this is not even the most extreme global pandemic that there's been. So what we're facing today in terms of the situation we're in is not unique, or it, nor is it new. That is not what makes the time that we're living in special or beyond special, spectacular. Having to meet over Zoom or virtual, some virtual platform, that is new simply because we live in a technology age. But that's not what I'm referring to. Not being able to meet together, that's not new. What I'm referring to when I say that we live in spectacular times is the fact that we are entering one of the most significant periods, one of the most significant milestones in God's 7,000 year plan with the earth. If you were to lay out God's 7,000 year plan on, on the table in front of you, look at the 7,000 year plan as a whole, and you were to put three major milestones in that 7,000 year plan, where would you put them? The first obviously would be at the death and resurrection of Christ. The second, at the return of Christ. And the third, at the conclusion of the seventh day, in the beginning of the eighth, when God is all and in all. Those are the three milestones. Those are the three major turning points in God's plan with, with the earth, with the, human, uh, with, with, with the human race on the earth. The death and resurrection of Christ, the return of Christ, and the beginning of the eighth day when God is all in all. And each of those are in progressing significance, are they not? The death and resurrection of Christ, it changed the landscape of the earth. Politically, globally, historically. Even atheists look back and that is the point in time when history, like everything in history is measured by that point. There's no one on this earth, whether they believe in God or not, and whether they accept Christ or not, there's no one on this earth who doesn't know that event. The death and resurrection of Christ was the first major milestone in the history of, of or, or God's 7,000 year plan with the earth. The second will be even greater than that. The second will be the return of Christ. The return of Christ will reshape the earth physically, politically, socially, like there has been never before. And then finally, at the end of the seventh day, at the beginning of the eighth, when God is all in all, and God's plan and purpose with this creation comes to fulfillment, then that is the greatest milestone 
that we have laid before us. We are, brethren and sisters, at the doorstep of the next milestone. We are here, ready for the knocking of the bridegroom on our door. And it's happening before our eyes. Which is why I wanted to look at Zechariah 2 and 3. Because, like we said, the Zechariah, the first six chapters of Zechariah, are visions of the kingdom. Visions of the establishment of the kingdom. Not simply visions of the kingdom having been established, but they are visions of the kingdom being established, which is the time that we're living in today. So a bit of context into Zechariah, and this is not intended to be a study of Zechariah, and it's not even intended to be a study of, of chapter 2 and 3. I just want to draw some lessons from, from these chapters. But for context, Zechariah lived in the time that the temple was being rebuilt. And Zechariah lived at the closure of the 70-year prophecies. And if you've ever spent much time with the 70-year prophecies, you'll know that there's actually multiple 70-year spans uh, that overlap. And the two most significant being 70 years from when the temple was burned to 70, year, 70 years later when the foundation of the temple was laid. And again, 70 years from when the last captivity, uh, the last of the children of Israel were taken captive, 70 years later to when the temple was finished. Zechariah is written at the end of that last 70 year period when the temple is being built and finished. The temple, uh, the temple was concluded while uh, in, in the midst of, of uh, or, or Zechariah was prophesying, the book of, of Zechariah was written, chapter 1, it's being built. By the time you get to the end of Zechariah, uh, the temple has been concluded. So Zechariah is prophesying at a very significant time, in, prophetically, in the, in the history of Israel. The Jews of that day, the faithful Jews of that day, knew the time that it was. They knew the 70 year prophecy. The 70 year prophecy was given to them that they would know how long they would be in captivity. So they knew of the 70 year period that they were waiting to return to the land and rebuild the temple. And Zechariah specifically makes mention of the 70 years in verse 12 of chapter 1. If we look in chapter 1 and verse 12, it says, The angel of Yahweh answered and said, O Yahweh of hosts, how long wilt thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah, against which thou hast had indignation these three score and ten years, or these seventy years? Now note, the temple is being built still, so that the, the last seventy-year period is when this, the temple is concluded. So maybe this was in year 68 or 69, we don't know. Uh, but it was in progress of the temple being built. But they know that they're at the end of that 70 years. They're waiting for the conclusion of it. Uh, uh, Habakkuk was, uh, was contemporary with Zechariah. The, the prophecies of Habakkuk also talk about these. Nehemiah and Ezra were not uh, immediately preceded Zechariah. Uh, Nehemiah and Ezra also were waiting for the end of that 70 year period. They make mention of it. They know that the time that they're living in, and they know that that time is coming to a close. And they're looking forward to that day when that 70 years will be done, and they can return to the land, and they can rebuild the temple. That's what they're focused on. And here, Zechariah is living in that time. And that's when these visions are coming to pass, or these visions are being given to him. So the, the book of Zechariah can be divided into four different sections, and I won't go through the four different sections. But the first of the four sections is, is what we could call the Zechariah's seven night visions. So the first section uh, is seven visions that are given to Zechariah. And they're all given to him in one night. And we see that in, in chapter 1 and verse 7. It says, Upon the four and twentieth day of the eleventh month, which is the month Sebat, in the second year of Darius came the word of Yahweh unto Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Iddo, the prophet, saying, I saw by night and behold. And that's the beginning of the first vision. So on this day, on the four and twentieth day of the eleventh month, in the night, God gives him seven consecutive visions. Seven visions which we have here. And there's seven visions of the establishment of the kingdom. They're, they begin... In the first vision, in chapter 1, they begin with the nations being uh, in, in quiet, in quiet confidence and their, uh, their own complacency. 
And God's looking on the nations and seeing them in their own corruption. And his indignation is stirred against them in the first vision. And the seven visions step through the progression of going from him looking at the nations and them seeing them being in complacency and corruption and serving themselves and persecuting his people Israel to seven visions later we have God's spirit having gone through the earth and the earth is again at rest but now it's at rest because it is being ruled by Christ so we have in these seven visions we have the kingdom being established and, and if we look in those two verses that I was referring to if we look in chapter 1 and verse 15 and God says in the vision to Zechariah he says I am very sore displeased with the nations with the heathens that are at ease for I was but a little displeased and they helped forward the affliction now all these visions when, when we talk when we look at them they are I guess uh, you, you could say first and foremost applicable to Zechariah and his day everything that we talk everything that we see in these seven visions are actually parables taken from what Zechariah is facing in his day so the language that is used is applicable to Zechariah's day but it's prophetic it's also prophetic in it we see a prophecy as we said of of the of the kingdom being established so it begins in verse uh, verse 14 and 15 saying I am jealous for Jerusalem for Zion with great jealousy I am very di sore displeased with the nations that are at ease because they've been persecuting my people Israel that's where it begins and if we turn over to chapter 6 they said the, the seven visions go into chapter 6 and verse um, verse 8 so the seventh vision concludes in verse 8 of chapter 6 and what does it conclude with? It says, Then cried he unto me, and spake unto me, saying, Behold, these that go towards the north country have quieted my spirit in the north country. The, these that he's speaking about who have gone forth are, are his servants. Uh, in, in this case, it's the four horses, the four horsemen, that have gone and subdued the nations. And he says, my spirit is quieted. So we began with the spirit of God being stirred up in anger because the nations are at quiet and at ease. And it concludes with the spirit of God being at, being at ease or being quieted because he sees that his kingdom has been established. So that's, that's that what we find ourselves in uh, in the readings here. So... Coming to chapter 2 and 3, our readings this morning, both of these chapters speak of setting up a particular aspect of the kingdom. It's not, like we said, it's not simply a vision of what the kingdom will be, but it's talking about, both chapter 2 and 3 are talking about particular aspects of the kingdom and how they were set up, where they came from, where they were before, and then how it was set up. To be the fulfillment of, of God's purpose. Chapter 2 is establishing, is talking about establishing Jerusalem as the capital and the seat of the rule. Or we can think of it as the governing aspect. It's the throne, the throne of David being established. Now the throne is not specifically mentioned, but what he's talking about is establishing Jerusalem as the capital. Jerusalem as the place where he will dwell among his people. So chapter 2 is talking about establishing his throne as this Jerusalem as his throne in the seat of the ruling of his kingdom. Chapter 3 is talking about establishing the priesthood, the high priesthood. So we have the king and we have the priest. And I don't want to get into this, but we also have in Zerubbabel and in Joshua. So chapter 3 is talking about Joshua the high priest. Zerubbabel was the governor in this day, in Zechariah's day. Zerubbabel was the governor of Jerusalem. Joshua was the high priest. And the two of them worked together. And if you go through and you look at Zerubbabel, if you look up the word Zerubbabel, almost every time Zerubbabel is mentioned, he's mentioned alongside Joshua the high priest. Zerubbabel was of the lineage of David. 
David, Solomon, Rehoboam, Josiah, Hezekiah, Zerubbabel. A few more generations in between. Zerubbabel was of the line of David, and he was the governor here at this time when these visions of the establishment of the kingdom were, were given. And he, alongside Joshua, or Yahshua, which we know is the, same, is the name of Christ, Yahshua is the high priest. Zerubbabel was the governor. The line of David and the line of the priesthood. So we have the king priest here. So in chapter 2 and chapter 3, we have the establishment of the government in Jerusalem, the seat, the throne of David. In chapter 3, we have the establishment of the priesthood, the high priesthood. In chapter 2, we can see this. When we read through it, I'm sure it was very very obvious, you know, that this was speaking of, of the kingdom age. But if we look in chapter 10, or sorry, in chapter 2 and verse 10, Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I come, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, saith Yahweh. Many nations shall be joined to Yahweh in that day, and shall be my people. And I will dwell in the midst of thee, Jerusalem. And thou shalt know that Yahweh of armies has sent me unto thee. And Yahweh shall inherit Judah, his portion, and the Holy Land, and shall choose Jerusalem again. Be silent, O all flesh before Yahweh, for he has raised up out of his holy habitation. How can that be mistaken for, any, for anything else but the establishment of the kingdom in Jerusalem, or the throne in Jerusalem? So we see here, it's a vision of what's to come. But what comes before that? What preceded, preceded this event? What preceded the fact that Jerusalem would be the seat of, of Yahweh or the throne of David? It says in verse 1 and 2 of chapter 2, I lifted up mine eyes and, and again, behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. Then said I, Whither goest thou? And he said unto me, To measure Jerusalem, to see what is the breadth thereof, and what is the length thereof. We might read that and be like, well, okay. He went to measure it. He went to see what the size is. He wanted to see what the breadth and the length of it was. That word, the, 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 the measuring line, the measuring line in his hand, we might think back to Ezekiel 40, when Ezekiel saw a vision, and in it, in the vision, there was a man with the with the reed who went to measure the, the the temple. And there's other examples of a reed or a line being used to measure something out, in terms of you know dimensions or whatever it might be. That's not what this word is. That word is actually, this word the measuring line is a different word than what's used in Ezekiel forty. It's the word chebel, c h e b e l. And it means to measure out a punishment or a reward. Most often we see it in one or two contexts. When God is going out and he's meeting out the destruction, it's the same word. He's meeting out the destruction of the nations, or in some cases to Israel. He was measuring out the destruction and the punishment to them. On the other hand, it's also used to measure out the inheritance. What would be given to them? Those are almost every case. It is one of those two contexts, either measuring out the des destruction or punishment or measuring out the reward. And so what Zechariah is seeing in this vision is the angel going out, this man going out to measure Jerusalem, to see if Jerusalem is ready. Jerusalem has been under great persecution for all of their history. But how could they not? How could they not go through the fire? We know that the fire that Israel will go through, that Jerusalem will go through, the heat, the hottest point of the fire is still yet to come. We know Russia will come down. We know Jerusalem will once more go through the furnace again. And it will be the harshest judgment that they've seen, or the harshest fire that they've been through. We know that they will be conquered and trodden down, and two-thirds of them will be killed. 
Why do they need to go through this? Because it's preparing them for Christ to come and to establish his seat in Jerusalem. Of all the cities, of all the places in, in the world, Christ has chosen that place to put his throne. So how much more does that place need to go through the fire? Because that will be where he rules the whole world. But the point is, before that can happen, Jerusalem must be measured with the measuring line to see if they're ready. And obviously we can take lessons from this and we'll draw this to us in a, in a moment. But the point is before the beauty of the vision of the kingdom is established, it first must be prepared and it first must go through both persecution and reward. They must be measured to see if they are prepared. In chapter three, in chapter, th in chapter two, we said we see the establishment of the, the capital, the seat of, of ruling. In chapter three, we see the establishment of the high priesthood. Joshua was the actual high priest in Zechariah's day. And he is obviously a type of Christ in, in this chapter. Well, not just in this chapter. He's obviously a type of Christ. Besides the fact that they share, share the same name. In verse eight of chapter three, it says, uh, Hear, O now, Joshua the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. This is obviously referring to Christ. Again, in verse 9, For behold, the stone that I have, I, that, the stone that I have laid before Joshua. So we have the branch, we have the stone, we have Joshua, the name of Christ. This is speaking of Christ. Christ in his in his role as high priest. There's no question of that. However, we said this is talking about the establishment of the kingdom. Christ was not made a high priest, or Christ, it's not that Christ will, will be made a high priest at the time that the kingdom is established. Christ has been a high priest for 2,000 years. Christ was made the high priest when he ascended to the right hand of his father. So in what aspect is this, this vision pointing forward to the kingdom that is yet to be fulfilled? In what aspect is this chapter talking about what we have to look forward to? Christ is already the high priest, we said. So what is it we see here? And I don't, I don't want to limit this and say that this is only speaking of future things. There's, a great, there's great lessons on the atonement that can be taken from the first part of the chapter with the with the filthy garments but we're not going into that right now if we look in verse 7 it says thus saith Yahweh of armies if thou walk in my ways and if thou wilt keep my charge then wilt thou also judge my house that word judge is also the word govern govern my house Israel and ultimately the saints as well and the whole world. So it, it talks about the aspect of governing or ruling. Again, continuing on in verse 7, And thou shalt keep my courts, or the courts of my temple. That word courts is referring to the temple. So it's the aspect of ruling, governing, sitting on the, the seat of David, and keeping the courts of the temple. But again, we could say in some ways that Christ is already fulfilling that. But look at the end of verse 7. I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by. In this verse, it's not talking about Christ's role today. Yes, he's ruling in the nations today. It's talking about when Christ will walk among those that stand by, among his saints and his brethren. When he will judge the house of Israel, when he will govern the house of Israel and keep the courts alongside his brethren. Again, in verse 8, we looked at the branch, but it says, Hear now, Joshua the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee. 
for they are men wondered at. Behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. So we see the fellows sitting with the high priest. And before those fellows, the branch is brought forth. And again in verse 9, Behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua, the stone which is Christ, upon one stone shall be seven eyes. And what do we think of when we think of seven eyes? We think of the seven lampstands. We think of the, the, the eyes of the cherubim. We think about the multitudinous Christ. So what we see here is not Christ being established the high priest, but Christ being established the high priest of the priesthood in the kingdom. This is the establishment of the high priesthood in the, in, in the kingdom. When all the saints with Christ will govern and keep the courts. So this is a vision of what is to come. It's the, the establishment, as we said, of the throne in chapter 2 and the high, priest, the high, high priesthood, the eternal priesthood in the kingdom. But where did it start? We said both of these show where it came from first. Where did it start? At the beginning of chapter 3, it talks about the filthy garments of Joshua being removed. Now, in a literal sense, in Zechariah's day, Joshua, in Zechariah's day, was wearing filthy garments. Why was he wearing filthy garments? It was because Zechariah and Zerubbabel were among the laborers, swinging the hammer, or whatever tools they were using. They were among the laborers building the temple. Joshua and Zerubbabel were not standing off to the sideline, pointing and directing and telling the laborers to do the work. They were there among them. And so Joshua's garments were filthy because of the work. Joshua and Zechariah's day, his garments were filthy, they were dirty because of the work that he was doing. And what does that symbolize? It symbolizes the fact that Christ, in building his spiritual house, was among his brethren. Not just simply physically in the presence of his brethren, but he was made in all points like us. The garments that he wore in the days of his mortality, the, 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 the nature that we all bear, Christ wore the same filthy garments. But when he died and was raised, and raised to the right hand of his father, he put off those filthy garments and he put on that white, pure garment and took on the role of high priest. The last point that I want to draw out of these, of these visions, the seven visions, is a theme that comes out. And that is a theme that Zechariah repeats over and over and over again. In chapter 1, in verse 8, at the beginning of the first vision, he says, I saw by night and beheld. Behold, I saw and I beheld. Verse 18 of chapter 1, Then lifted up mine eyes and I saw and I beheld. Chapter 2, verse 1, I lift up mine eyes again and looked and behold. Chapter 5 and verse 1. Then I turned and I lifted up mine eyes and looked and behold. Verse nine, chapter 5 and verse 9. Then lifted up mine eyes and looked and behold. In chapter 6. And I turned and I lifted up mine eyes and looked and behold. What is the theme that we see here? We see Zechariah turning his attention to those things which lie ahead. He's lifting up his eyes from the things on the earth. He's lifting up his eyes from the things of this life, mortality. And he's looking up. And he sees. And he beholds the beauty that is to come. He's turning his eyes towards the vision that's before him. Those things that are eternal, the joy, 
that is to come. He's turning his eyes away from the difficulty of the situation he's in. They're still in captivity at this point, though they are in Jerusalem building the temple. They're still being persecuted. They're still suffering adversity. And the 70 years hasn't yet been fulfilled. They know it's at the end. But he turns his eyes away from those things. He turns his eyes and he lifts them up. And he beholds the things that are before him. The beauty of the vision of the kingdom that is to come. And that's what you and I, brethren, need to be doing. We are at the doorstep, not at the end of the 70 years. We're at the end of the 6,000 years. We are at the doorstep of this vision being fulfilled. We're at the doorstep of Christ's return. And Christ says in Luke chapter 21, There shall be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars, and upon the earth the stress of nations and perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up. What did Zechariah do? He lifted up his eyes. Then look up and lift up your head, for your redemption draweth nigh. Brethren and sisters, that's where we are. We are here. We have it before us. It is unfolding before us. We need to lift our heads up, lift up our eyes from the immediate obvious things that we face today and see them for what they are. We see them for 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 God, we see them as God's hand fulfilling his will. Not just any portion of prophecy, but the most significant portion of prophecy to date. It is the events that will bring the return of Christ. Now, will, it, will Christ return this year? I pray. We have 11 days left in this year, and I pray it's within the 11 days. But maybe it's three years from now or five years. I don't know. But what is that in the drop of 6,000 years? It's in our lifetime. Besides the obvious things with the pandemic and the basis of men on both sides, battling for power and government here in the U.S. What has happened on the global stage this year? Have we been paying attention to the effect that these things have been having? Not simply the fact that the pandemic and the election and whatever else is going on, but what is the effect that it's having? How are these things tools in God's hand that he's using to set up the chessboard. It's like watching a chess game and initially you don't know what's going on. You don't know what's going on in the mind of the, the, the chess player. But as you get closer, as you get closer to that checkmate, you start to see the plan come together. And you start to be like, oh yeah, I see he moved that piece there. And I think I'm pretty sure I know what he's going to do with that piece because he moved this other piece over here. And we know what his end goal is. And we're seeing the pieces come together. We don't have complete clarity. But we're seeing the pieces move together. We can get caught up in the fact that we're in a pandemic or the fact that we're stuck at home or whatever it is. We're, we, can, we can get caught up in the fact that this election was, was bloody and, and corrupt and whatever, whatever it might be. That's beside the point. What is the effect? How has God used these events to establish his will? Beside those things, what else has happened this year? Now, I'm not going to turn this into a, a, a current events class, but just quickly to list off a few things. We've seen peace established between Israel and three of its neighbors. Three peace accords between Israel and three nations that we never would have thought would be the nations, well, besides prophecy. Three, three nations that Israel was not in good standing with. The UAE, Sudan, and Bahrain. Now, interestingly, what's unique about the, the agreement with Sudan, 
is Sudan and Israel have not been trading missiles or weaponry uh, or shooting at each other, I should say, but they have been officially in a status of at war. So they went from a status of at war with each other to signing a peace agreement. Three, this year. When was the last time Israel signed a peace accord with any other nation? 26 years ago. The last one was 26 years ago. And the one before that was 42 years ago. So 42 years ago, 26 years ago, and then three this year. And there's others who are following suit. Turkey has appointed an ambassador in Israel for the first time since 2010 and has started normalizing relations. The Kingdom of, of Bhutan, December 12th, just a few days ago, said that they are working to establish normal relations with Israel. Where did this come from? Israel suddenly making peace with its neighbors. Not all the neighbors, obviously. Tensions rising between Syria, Iran, and Israel. Israel has done two airstrikes in the last month against Syria, but not just anywhere in Syria, in Damascus. Israel has, for the most part, avoided Damascus, the capital of, of Syria. In the last month, two airstrikes in Damascus. We know Damascus must be a rubble, a, a, a heap, and destroyed and taken away from being a city before Christ comes. Whether we see that or we don't, whether it's part of Russia coming down, we don't know. But Israel is escalating with Syria, escalating with Iran. Iran is threatening retaliation if any of Iran's troops are hit in, in Syria. And of course, we all know that about the Iranian nuclear sci uh, scientist that was assassinated. In the meantime, Russia has come out and said, the problem in the Middle East, in the Middle East is Israel. Iran, Syria, and Palestine are not to be blamed. That was a Russian deputy minister of defense or whatever. Israel is the problem. Iran, Syria, and the Palestinians are not to be blamed. So here, Israel's escalating. And Russia's saying, Israel's the bully, and they're going to defend Syria and Iran if Israel does anything. In the meantime, Britain, the Tarshish power, the exit of, of EU. I'm sure we've all been hearing about Brexit for the last number of years. This was something the Brotherhood has been talking about for nearly 175 years before the EU was ever even formed. The Brotherhood knew that Britain would be joined with Europe and then must leave. And we're seeing it. And you're probably thinking, yeah, Brexit's been going on for, I don't know, three years, four years, five years now. Uh, you know, what's relevant about it this year? What's changed this year? Well, in reality, you and I don't live there, so we're not going to feel much of the change. But officially, Brexit went into effect January 31st of this year, nearly 11 months ago. January 31st of this year, Britain is no longer part of the EU. But again, what changed? Actually, not much. Because they knew that the divide between Britain and Europe would be so difficult they actually extended, even though officially Britain is no longer part of the EU, they allowed basically all operations, most operations to continue for 11 months. That way they could work out a deal and negotiate how these relationships would look. 11 months they had to negotiate this deal. That 11 months is up on December 31st, in 11 days from now. And on December 31st, there is no deal. They have not reached an agreement. And unless they can reach an agreement in 11 days, deal or no deal, Britain and Europe are officially and operationally completely separate entities. Again, that probably won't affect us, you and I, because we don't live there. But prophetically, Britain and Europe are no longer cooperating. In the meantime, in the EU, in Europe, we have the prophecy of uh, Nebuchadnezzar's image. 
And Brother Thomas says, we we're waiting for the day for that image to stand up. Because when that image stands up, then the next step is for the stone to come in. In Europe, about five or six years ago, they started something that they called the cohesion study. We know the feet of the image made of iron and clay and do not mix together. Some weak, some strong. Five years ago, I think, they started what's called the EU cohesion study to see how well all the, the nations of Europe are, co uh, are working together. And what did it expose? That they're not. That the cohesion is very weak between these nations. Now, interestingly, over the years that they've been doing, they do the study every year. And over the years, 2019 was the highest, even though it's still not strong, 2019 was the highest cohesion score that the nations of Europe got. And then the virus hit. And in 2020, the cohesion is the lowest. Now, they're working together. They're working together in terms of supporting each other and helping each other. But that's not what the study is about. The study is about how well the attitudes of the nations are aligned. How well are the people thinking of each other as, as you know, um, I don't know, whatever they, you know, thinking positively of their neighbor country. How well are the governments collaborating and are aligned or are they conflicting? Obviously, they're supporting each other and there are pieces that they're working together. But 2019, the cohesion dropped. We see the toes of iron and clay separating. Now, what's interesting is what we see, the t details of this, is in the cohesion study, there were very clearly two groups of nations. The nations, as the study says, the nations in the north which are financially secure and have, in the words of the study, a strong economy. And the nations in the South, which have a weak economy. So we have two groups of nations, a clear divide, the strong and the weak. And the strong, this year in 2019, have been supporting the weak and it's increasing tensions. And in the study, in the words of the study, it notes that in an unfortunate coincidence, it was the Southern nations with the weak economies that were hit the hardest with the virus. An unfortunate coincidence. We know better than that. We know it is God furthering this divide, highlighting the fact that there are the weak and the strong they're all one. They're all part of this, these feet that the image is standing on. But the cohesion is fracturing. And guess who's standing up to try to unify them? To try to bring them together? Pope Francis, on Wednesday, urged Europe to remain united in overcoming the effects of the coronavirus pandemic speaking at on the eve of the EU summit to discuss a huge but divisive economic stimulus package where the strong would support the weak. The pandemic has put new strains on the unity of the 27 member bloc, again exposing the splits between the rich in the north and the poor in the south. It's the Pope that is standing up to be the one voice that is trying to hold Europe together. We're seeing the image stand on its feet, brothers and sisters. Luke chapter 10 says, verse 23 and 24, And he, Christ, turned to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things that you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see those things which you see and have not seen them. And hear the things which you hear and have not heard them. 6,000 years, brethren and sisters, the saints, the prophets, the faithful have wanted to see the day that we're seeing today. And we're the generation that gets to witness it. We're the generation 
that gets to see these things fulfilled. How do we look at these things? Do we feel sorry for ourselves because we're in the midst of this? Do we feel sorry for us, ourselves, because we're suffering the inconvenience of these events happening? It's not easy. I'm not saying it is. We've all been shut at home. We've all suffered the effects of this. But do we look at it in despair? Are we really concerned about the accuracy of the election? Are we really concerned about our rights being taken away and trampled on? Are we really concerned about what conspiracy may or may not have influenced the masses here in the US or in Australia or in Britain or wherever it may be? In the Brotherhood today, we have seen not just here in North America, but worldwide, we have seen an influx of the Brotherhood getting involved in politics, getting involved in the social agendas of today. Is that really what matters to us, brothers and sisters? Does it really matter what political party is in power? Corrupt party one or corrupt party two? Or whether one did the other one worse? Or whether one's trying to take control or do things that they shouldn't? Whether Republican or Democrat, or if you're in Canada, Green Party, NDP, Conservative, Liberal, it doesn't matter what the party is. Not a single one of them have an ounce of power to do a single thing if that power was not given to them by God. Christ told Pilate, you have no power at all against me unless it has been given to you from above. They think that they're in control. They think that they are pushing their own agendas. They think that they are battling and manipulating. They're not. God is establishing the stage exactly as he planned he would. And we should be witnesses, observing what is going on, not just the decisions that are being made, but the effect that it's having on the global stage. God has always used corrupt governments to accomplish his will. It was the Jews in power in Christ's day, and it was their corruption that brought forth the most monumental accomplishment towards offering salvation to us. It was the fact that the Jews were more concerned with their own position and power. That is what brought Christ to the cross. But did they have any power of themselves? They were simply fulfilling the will of God. Was it fair? No. Not from a human's perspective. Were they trying to exercise their own power and control and influence? Absolutely. But it was exactly as God had planned. AD 70, Jerusalem, destroyed by the Romans, the corrupt, barbaric, pagan Romans. Was it fair? Absolutely not. Did it hurt the saints? Did they feel pain from it? Absolutely. But the Romans were simply vessels executing God's plan. Hitler, one of the most well-known symbols of an evil man in power. Nothing fair, right, honest, a perfect example of what propaganda looks like and lies and influencing the masses. And yet God was using him to bring back the Jews to the land exactly as he prophesied he would in, in Jeremiah. We could go on. Nero, Alexander the Great, Napoleon, Turkish Empire, the Assyrian, Cyrus, my servant. They were all corrupt leaders, seeking their own selfish ambition, trampling on the faithful, abusing the rights of men, ex trying to exert control, lying, deceiving, truly the basest of men. And yet every one of them, unbeknownst to themselves, were simply pawns in the hands of God, setting the stage and executing God's plan each step of the way. And that's what we're seeing today, brethren and sisters. We find ourselves in the same situation. Should we really care how corrupt this election was? Should we get 
caught up in the frame of mind of who was right and who was wrong? Or should we sit back in amazement, in jubilation, that we're getting to witness, we are the generation that gets to witness God's hand, putting the final pieces in place on the world stage, nearly a week in a week-to-week cadence, singing praise that we are the generation that gets to see this, that 6,000 years of the faithful wanted to see but didn't get to. Think back to the birth of Christ, Simon and Anna, two seemingly insignificant characters who get very little attention. And yet they're in the midst of the Roman occupation when Jerusalem was under the corrupt government of the Romans, the corrupt political power struggling and the struggles of the Jewish priest and the Pharisees trying to exert their own position of, of influence. What were Simon and Anna concerned about? They were concerned about waiting and watching for the birth of Christ. They knew the time was at hand, the same way that Zechariah knew that the 70 years was at hand. They knew, they didn't know exactly when, but they knew that the time was at hand, that the Redeemer would be born. They were watching and waiting at the temple for that first major milestone. And now we are at the second. In Luke chapter 2, speaking of Anna, it says, And she came in that instant and gave thanks likewise unto the Lord, and spake of him to all of them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. That's where her attention was. That she knew the time was right, and she saw the events unfolding, that she knew the redeemed of the Lord was to be born. And she was waiting. And in, in hymn 361 that we sang just before the emblems, or just before the excitation. It says, let me find it in here. It talks about at midnight comes the cry. Yeah, the end of the first verse. Soon he draweth nigh up, pray, and watch and wrestle. At midnight comes the cry. Midnight is the darkest point. Of course it's going to be dark, brethren and sisters. Of course it's going to be difficult before the return of Christ. Because it's not at the, the beauty of the day that the cry comes. It's at midnight. In reading the last verse, O hope and expectation, O Jesus, now appear. Arise, thou son, so longed for, or this benighted sphere. With hearts and hands uplifted, we plead, O Lord, to see the day of earth's redemption that brings us unto thee. That's what we're here for, brethren and sisters. Now we're about to partake of the emblems. The bread and the wine are the emblems that we have. We've had them for 2,000 years. Before that, Israel had the Passover feast. Before that, there was the burnt offering. Every generation for the last uh, 6,000 years has had an emblem that they kept to remind them of what was to come. Every generation has had of the faithful have had Christ set before them as a reminder to look forward to see his day. And brothers and sisters, we are the generation that gets to see that fulfilled. It gets, we get to watch it unfold in our, before our living eyes. Again, is it this year? Three years from now? Five years from now? I don't know when. But I know, we know, that these things are unfolding at a speed that we never would have thought we would have seen. And there's not much left. If you look at the prophecies that talk about what will herald the return of Christ, nearly all the checkboxes have been checked. There's not much more that needs to happen. The groom is near, brethren and sisters. He's going to come, he's going to call, he's going to knock. And are we going to be ready? Pretty soon, that line... That measuring line that will be used to measure us will be taken out and we will be measured. And so now is our time, brothers and sisters, to put our own houses in order. To lift up our eyes and to turn and behold, as Zechariah did, the vision that lays before us. So as we partake of the emblems, the bread and the wine... 
Let us cast our minds to that eternal priesthood that is to be is very soon established, in that temple, in that throne that is to be set up. And let us focus on those things which are eternal. And let us cast our minds on those things that we have to look forward to. Thank you.